Hi everyone, sorry I've not done any videos for a while. This is always the busiest time of the year for me in terms of the day job. For those of you who don't know, I'm a full-time broadcaster covering English football, English soccer, and May is the end of the season. It's when you have the playoffs as well. This has been the busiest time of year that I've ever had doing this job. And uh, it's meant that I've not had a lot of time for blog stuff, for channel stuff. You know, I do this as a hobby and I've not had much free time to get involved in it. So now I have got a bit of free time this weekend. I wanted to put a video out and just offer some thoughts on the Seahawks defence. You may have noticed over the last few weeks, there's been this kind of game of musical chairs happening with the nose tackle position. And uh, the team is having a look at certain guys and they're moving on others on. Uh, they're trying to find somebody, I sense, who can just add a bit of depth and competition in there to that defensive front. And I think some fans were a little bit concerned about this because, I mean, that's understandable, the run defence has not been good enough for a couple of years at least. And... In particular, last year was a real concern. And while a lot of other issues and a lot of talent has been added to the team this offseason, there is still that question mark about how good the run defence is. So I want to offer some thoughts on that. First of all, I want to start with some context, though. And this is a point that I made right at the end of the draft. Um, that when you think back to the 2013 defence, and I always like to compare to you know one of the greatest defences that has ever played the NFL. But when you look back at that group, they didn't have those elite interior defensive lineman. There was no and like Peak and Domican Sue or Aaron Donald in that team. What they had was a collection of guys who could do a job. So Brandon Meebain was a really solid starter. You know, maybe even better than a solid start. Maybe I'm doing him down a little bit there. But you know, it wasn't a game wrecking defensive tackle. They had Clinton McDonald who was kind of a specialist interior pass rusher and they had guys who could fit in around that you know red bryant basically played as an enormous five technique so it, it, it wasn't really that they had amazing interior presence it was just that they had a, a, a decent group of guys a bit of depth and a, and a reasonable rotation and i think when you actually look at what they've got defensive tackle right now it's kind of similar and it's easy to sort of linger on the nose tackle position which is essentially a two down position and forget that you know this is still a team that has gone and made a major investment in Draymond Jones. You know, the, the kind of move that I think a lot of people were crying out for them to go and do, you know, go make a big splash on the defensive line. And they did that at the start of free agency. And, you know, that was the thing they needed to do. Yes, it would have been nice if they could have gone out and got um, a really talented nose tackle as well. But, you know, that I, I don't know who that is. And they went and got an impact defensive lineman, which is what everybody was hoping they would, they would go and do. So first of all, let's just get out, that out of the way. The second thing I would say is, you know, I'm a huge Cameron Young fan and anybody who followed the blog or this channel around the Senior Bowl knows that I was singing his praises. I thought he was one of the most underrated players in Mobile. I think that there's a, a reasonable chance that he could be this year's answer to Abe Lucas, somebody who shone at the Senior Bowl, has a lot of the things that you want at his particular position, for some reason is just completely overlooked in the draft process. The Seahawks take him in the middle rounds and he ends up shining and in 12 months time we're talking about how the heck did they get that guy in the fourth round and in Abe Lucas's case the third round. I think there's a decent chance of that. So I'm comfortable and confident that he's going to be better than maybe most people expect there. So that's the first thing I would say about, the second thing I would say rather about the Seahawks defensive tackles and their interior line. However, I think the, the the concern for me lies in the depth and the reliance on a rookie, the fact that there isn't a, a hardened veteran who, if nothing else, can just produce solid reps on first and second down or those clear running situations. That's that's a little bit of a concern there. They, I, don't, I hope they don't end up putting all of their eggs in the Cam Young basket because just because I'm saying he could be the next Abe Lucas... You know, it, it may take him a year or two to work things out. It may never work out for him. You know, relying on mid-round rookies is not ideal. What you really want to do is have him eased into it and have him win the job and earn those reps over the veteran. And they don't have even a, you know, a 30-year-old vet who can come in and, and sort of just show him the ropes. It's it's why I'm a little bit iffy on the fact that they cut Al Woods. And, and this is sort of the, the main concern that I would have or the main problem I would raise from this offseason because I think they've had a great offseason again I think they've done a lot of great things I gave them an A plus for the draft once more but the fact that they are spending 40 million dollars on the safety position just I, it's just a mistake in my opinion to have that much committed at safety 
And, and yes, the scheme, by all accounts, the way they're setting it up, sounds like safety is going to be a really important position. But how can you be paying, you know, $18.1 million still for Jamal Adams? How have they not gone to him and said, look, we need to do something about this cap here because you've just been too injured. We don't know what you're going to be able to provide this year. We, we've got to come up with a solution here. And if he wasn't willing to help the team and work through that, you've seriously got to think about was a post-June 1st cut weeks ago the best thing to do so that even if it's not just to keep our woods it's to go and get somebody else who can can fill that role and I still maintain look for the cost of Jamal Adams if you'd have done a post June 1st cut you would have saved 8.4 million dollars this year that would have been enough to keep Ryan Neal and Al Woods I personally think Ryan Neal and Al Woods would have been better than Jamal Adams for this year I think you're a better defense I don't think there's any his injury is so serious, you don't even know what you're going to get out of him. I've seen people on Twitter saying things, can't wait to see 17 games of Jamal Adams. I mean, how anybody, you just, you just, that is beyond blind faith at this point that he can play 17 games. I, I don't, I think he'd be blind faith to even expect him to be ready in week one. And if he is, great. But it, how can you have any optimism here? And the, and the more realistic prospect is he's going to start the season on the pub list, I would suggest. We don't have enough information to start with any confidence, but that's the way it seems to be trending right now. And then who knows when he comes back? Who knows what his impact's going to be? And he's got the highest cap hit on your roster. And then your second highest cap hit is Quandre Diggs, who's on 10 grand less than Jamal Adams. But you know, that's $36 million. Your two highest played, paid players on the team are Adams and Quandre Diggs. While you are fishing around trying to find a nose tackle at the same position, at the same time, that the league, you know, the market for safeties has collapsed. The league is saying, no, nah, we're not going to pay for safeties anymore. And and the one thing I think the Seahawks did very, very well 10 years ago when they were at their peak in the Carroll era was that they were ahead of the curve. You know, they would set trends. And now at the minute, they're kind of, there's been one or two examples of where they're, they're a little bit behind the curve. So as the league's paying less in safeties, investing in different positions, the Seahawks have suddenly found themselves where they're paying 36 million plus $36 million for Adams and Diggs. Then with Julian Love coming in and earning four million himself, forty million dollars for three safeties, and you're scrambling around trying to find a nose tackle. I just don't think that's the best use of your resources. Now, again, I don't think it'll matter too much, but here's what I want them to do to minimise this issue. I think you can get away with this better if you revert back to some of the four three under stuff, the classic Carroll stuff from yesteryear. I know they've said that they're going to do some of that, that there's going to be hybrids, it's going to be different looks, it's going to be different formations and stuff like that. And I appreciate all of that, and, and I expect some of that. You know, they are not an out-and-out 3-14, and they, when they were a 4-3 under, they, by all accounts, weren't an, an all-out 4-3 under. I'm not an X's and O's guy. I'm never going to pretend that I am. I'm never going to break down these schemes and stuff. But, you know, having spoken to people in the game and trying to learn a little bit about it <laughs> that's you know they've always kind of adjusted and, and and all teams do to a certain extent but I'd like to see them go back back to the past a little bit with their scheme maybe use a, a bit more of that because to me Draymond Jones as a Michael Bennett style five technique with Cam Young next to Jaron Reed with one of your edge rushers rushing the edge with three linebackers on the field that to me feels like that gives you a better chance to stop the run and still get some pass rush because we know Jones can do that. And then whether it's Daryl Taylor playing off the edge or Boya Mafe or Cheddar and Wosu, or maybe you're playing Wosu as a Sam and to get him on the field or Boya Mafe and then you and then you have Taylor on there. That to me seems like a way that you can defend the run, still generate some pressure on those early downs. And if they, if they do that more often than not, I don't think it's such a big problem that you don't necessarily need that big nose tackle. But I think if you are going to go with the 3-4, the traditional 3-4, and go with that, it, it's you need sort of that really big, massive force plug in the interior. And, and I just don't think... I, I, I worry a little bit if they go with that more often than not, then we'll see some of the same issues, that your linebackers will spend too much time going backwards than forwards, they're not just going to be pinning their ears down and getting after the quarterback, that they're not going to be able to stop the run, that they don't have the talent up front on the defensive line on those early downs to stop the run, and that's sort of where my concern is. So if Richard Sherman, when he's in his podcast, they're going back to the old scheme, if, if that is actually kind of what they're going to do here, 
I'm I'm very comfortable with everything. I'm 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 content. Obviously, we won't know the true answers to that until week one's come and gone. But I think that would be better for this team the way that they've been structured and built. At the same time, are you really paying forty million dollars at safety to go back to that when the the investment in that position suggests that you are going to be more hybrid, you are going to be more creative, you are going to try and find ways to get Jamal Adams blitzing and doing all of that stuff, which has always been a bit of an ill fit for me because he isn't, you know, Carroll and Clint Hurt are not Greg Williams. They're not Rex Ryan. And I don't think they've ever really found a way to make the most of Adams as a blitzer, which is his best thing, which is why I've always been a bit negative about that trade because I just don't think he's a fit. And, and I think it was a bit of a desperation move when it happened. Anyway, we don't need to go down that road all again. So that's my sort of thoughts on it. It is a little bit frustrating, like I've said, that they have they have got so much churned into this because I, I think the team is so close to being pretty complete. And although, there, you know, we can go through different talking points, you know, Geno Smith has got to be really consistent. He's got to be consistently good and not have the sort of the turnover-worthy plays that they had at the end of last season. You know, the, some of the younger offensive linemen have got to step up and take a step now. You know, you've got to get the most out of your weapons and do stuff like that. that I, I get all of that stuff, but I feel like they are quite... They're quite close to being complete. And I really hope that run defence and not being able to get the most out of the pass rushes that are on the roster and get them consistently creating pressure when you've invested so much and you've got a lot of talent off the edge now. That's that's sort of my thing that I'm slightly worried about. That and the fact that, you know, so far, I think I think this is a big year for Clint Hurt. I think he's got to, he's got to prove that he is a defensive coordinator in the NFL. You can maybe give him a mulligan for year one as he's learning the ropes. He's a rookie coordinator at that point. We need to see some improvements now. We need to see this team putting a defensive product that's not a liability on the field. We need to see them, you know, they don't have to be a top 10 defence necessarily, but they can't be wildly inconsistent. They can't be giving up massive amounts of yards. They can't be um, hopeless against the pass or the run. And, and mix in and out of that. They need to be somewhat more consistent. They need to find a way to create consistent pressure in, in you know, week to week, find some pass rush there that, could, that is consistent and they need to be able to stop the run. So those are my thoughts. I'm still very positive about where this roster is. And, and you know, it's June, I'm recording this on June the 4th. I wish it was September the 4th already. I can't wait for the season to start. I do think there's a lot of optimism about the Seahawks moving forward, but there's just just a few thoughts on the defence where they are at the moment. And I'd look, there's nobody out there. I've had a look at the free agent list. There's no veterans. I've had a look at potential trade candidates. I'm, I'm struggling to find any there as well. So I don't really know how they're going to solve this problem, getting in a big veteran productive nose tackle. I, I just don't really see it. So I think it's something where like, it could be a talking point throughout the year. And, and maybe in 12 months, we'll be talking about it a lot more that they need to go and get that. But if the, if the defence continues to struggle, who knows where the defence is going to be in, in a year's time. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section. Hit the like button, always really important for the channel. Subscribe if you haven't so you don't miss a video. Check out seahawksdraftblog.com for more analysis. Until next time, bye for now.